The Holy Spirit moved in the midst of those attending the 2016 World Conference, whether they shared in person or in the internet. In sacred worship, ordinations, business sessions, and moments spent talking with people from around the globe, we lived the conference theme, One in Christ. Colorful prayer flags strung on ribbons graced the conference chamber in the auditorium, swayed in the breezes between the green leaves of the ginkgo trees on the temple's world plaza, and spread messages of peace and hope on the windows overlooking the temple meditation garden. Thousands of prayers written, stitched, and drawn in many languages onto colored fabric were created by people of all ages from many nations. It was as if the 2016 World Conference was wrapped in the power of prayer. President and Prophet Steve Vesey joins me in Community of Christ broadcast studio to share his reflections about the 2016 World Conference and its impact on the future of our international faith movement. Steve, how would you describe the 2016 World Conference to people who were unable to attend? I, I would use a variety of, of words that I hope would communicate the essence of the con uh, conference because it's difficult to capture in just a few sentences. I think you've already mentioned one, the, the symbolism of the prayer flags all over the International Headquarters campus reminded me that the World Conference experience actually began months before World Conference as people created those flags and prayerfully reflected on conference whether they were going to be there or not and and that became then a blessing and that blessing was manifested in a spirit of peacefulness. I heard a lot of people use that term. I don't know what they were expecting, but they yes. said there was a peaceful spirit and they especially noticed it beginning with the communion service mm -hmm. on Sunday morning. And then it resided or, or dwelt with the conference throughout the week. And I think that's very significant in terms of our understanding of how God is involved in the, in the life of the church. Uh, positive, uh, I would use that word, uh, even as there were expected disagreements uh, between delegates or delegates and even church leadership over particular resolutions or proposals, it all occurred in a spirit of mutual respect uh, there was a positive uh, emphasis of everyone being committed as disciples and committed to the church. We just had different perspectives, and that's to be expected. But the way the conversation occurred is in such a contrast to what we see in society around us. It tell us, tells us we're making progress. Uh, in terms of our vision of what community of Christ should be. And I think finally I would use the word prophetic in that the church took yet another step in its growth and development as a prophetic movement of discerning God's will together, listening to one another, and then making decisions, sometimes in relation to specific issues such as some of the resolutions that were passed, uh, but also in terms of overall direction in the life of the church. So prayerful, peaceful, positive, prophetic yes. is how I would describe the conference. Those are good descriptions. I heard other people talking about that sense of community, yes. that that spirit moved in our midst and, and even just the situation of one in Christ and food trucks and people standing yeah. in line and the community, they came together in community in a very powerful way. I, I think one aspect of conference that really blessed us is we described it early on and continue to describe it in terms of our planning as being 
reunion-like or a reunion of the international church. So I think people brought the, the memories of reunion and expectations of reunion into the experience and, and that carried over into the quality of what we shared together. Yes, and we experienced on a stage with a big tent on the <laughs> World Plaza, we experienced the music and sounds of different cultures right. as we intermingled in those large gatherings of people, which I think was significant yes. as well. Yes, yeah. all of that and more. All of that and more, <laughs> you're right. After three years of discernment, the words of counsel that you presented to the 2013 World Conference and then shared with the church in April, the final version, were overwhelmingly approved by the delegates at the World Conference and are now in section 165 of the Doctrine and Covenants. As I've traveled after World Conference in the United States to reunions or family camps into congregations, I've been hearing these words read during worship services and teaching opportunities. Please share your testimony of how God is leading the church through these words that bring hope to those who seek to follow God's will. Well, continuing revelation uh, is of course one of the more unique or distinctive aspects of our faith movement and we experience it in many ways at the personal level, at the congregational level, but I think there's something very powerful when we come together as an international community and are ready to embrace an expression of perception of God's mind and will and adopt it as something that is a part of our canon of Scripture. So first of all, I think having that experience as we are led into it by the Spirit is important in the, in the life of the church to remind us that it is God who is guiding the church and that we pay attention to that today. Uh, these particular words, um, we talked about them for uh, three years and reflected on questions that people raised. And I think all of that enhanced our experience when we came together at World Conference. But I was encouraged there was still discussion and still questions being asked because that tells me people are engaged, they're taking it seriously. And that is very important in terms of the integrity of what goes into the Doctrine and Covenants, in my mind. The words themselves um, affirm the missional direction of the church. So the message there is stay focused on the mission, which is our best understanding of the mission of Jesus Christ. And that's about being faithful and being aligned with who Jesus was and is and what Christ is doing in the world. The theme of generosity uh, is not just a practical matter, and I keep trying to say that to the church. It is a spiritual matter that is directly linked to our growth as disciples and as a community or the kind of community that God is calling us to be. So the notion of linking mission, generosity, and tithing as a spiritual practice, uh, we need to go a lot deeper in our understanding of those words so that our actions can reflect the, the true uh, intent of those principles. Um, community. Uh, the phrase oneness and equality in Christ is not something we have achieved yet. Uh, even though we've made great strides in areas such as respecting other cultures, we're, we're making progress in terms of gender equality. But there's still a ways to go and we find ourselves still struggling with, with racism in, in the church 
and in congregations. We find ourselves still needing to grow in our capacity to recognize the inherent and equal worth of all people. So the phrase oneness and equality takes it a step further. And, and then finally, the words tell us once again that God is wanting to bless us as persons, but also in the context of our families and congregations and the other places or situations in which we're experiencing or can experience community that God is wanting to bless us in all of those different aspects of our lives. So the counsel regarding the sacrament of evangelist blessing is about a particular sacrament, but the meaning behind it is about the very nature of God who is wanting to bless us more than we currently perceive and perhaps are receiving. So that would be some of the ways that Section 165 is hopefully guiding the church. I especially, well, there's lots of parts of 165 that really resonate with me and call me to go deeper in my discipleship. I was struck by the words that continued uh, from the 2013 words of counsel about live, love, mm. and share Zion. Don't just sing and talk about it. It's time to live and love and share yeah. as Zion. Well, I, I think you'll find throughout those words of counsel this emphasis uh, using words like embody. Don't just talk about it, but become it. What you do actually reveals what you believe. Not just saying I'm for this or this is important. It, it needs to be inherently part of who you are as an individual disciple but also in the communities of disciples that we call congregations and emerging groups and groups of seekers and disciples. It's the being what we're talking about that God is, is calling us to. Yes. A new common consent process was used by the delegates considering the World Conference Resolution 1314, Mission and Tithing. Listening to various perspectives of the delegates, Surveying the body using electronic polling devices helped delegates to understand why people had particular levels of support. It also helped the presidency and the bishopric to listen to the words that were said and bring forth a final uh, document for the conference to consider having to do with mission and tithing. And as a result of that final version of Mission Tithing, it was supported by an amazing amount of people. 94% of the people supported Mission and Tithing, which is maybe historic, I, I don't know. So the, the common consent process worked. It worked really well in the listening and understanding and then reaching consensus. Tell us about the agreed upon definition of mission and tithing and how the words in that definition could find expression in the church as tithing becomes a spiritual practice in every aspect of a person or a community's life. Yeah. Well, we did experience uh, another significant step forward in terms of understanding how to work at and achieve common consent as a people. And that is important to our continued journey. And I'd be remiss if I didn't acknowledge, as I have been reminded by our common consent team, that we didn't use the whole process. Uh, we used more of the tools and more of the steps 
and gain more experience, both as church leaders and as delegates participating in the process. But once again, uh, we were blessed by a spirit of listening and appreciation for different perspectives. And we discovered that when we confer together in that way, in the spirit of worship, the common consent process includes moments of blessing to always cause back to centering ourselves in God's spirit that, that we find direction and guidance and a way forward um, in relation to issues around which people have diverse opinions. Uh, in this case, in terms of the definition, um, we began with a uh, very, what people called, wordy definition. It was uh, a complex definition. Um, and it attempted to draw in about everything that had been said uh, about tithing uh, since probably 2000. So it was all there, all the different parts. But the beauty of what happened at conference was once we wrestled with that complexity of everything that was there and separated out uh, principles from more specific practices in some parts of the world, we moved through complexity to a definition that was much more succinct and yet very profound. Uh, in my estimation, uh, a definition that is scopative in terms of its usefulness throughout the whole world across multiple cultures, and yet specific enough to provide um, guidance and direction. And I was also um, encouraged that uh, people referred to counsel that has been received and looked at the definition through that lens and wanted to be aligned uh, in language as well as concept with the definition. So the definition actually begins now with a reference to Doctrine and Covenants 165. Uh, I'll read just from the first part of the definition community of Christ has agreed that tithing is a spiritual practice that demonstrates willingness to offer every dimension of one's life to God. Well, starting with tithing is a spiritual practice is a direct reference to section 165. Um, the definition situates tithing within the broader concept of whole life stewardship, every aspect of my life. And that's exactly where it should be in terms of uh, restoration theology um, as well as our practical understanding that uh, our generosity symbolizes the giving of our, of our whole life. Um, the reconciliation between, if I can use that term, between the literal definition of tithing, one-tenth, and the spirit of tithing is giving to one's true capacity, recognizes uh, the wide breadth of capacity where one-tenth may be sacrificial for someone, and for another person it, it may not be much at all uh, because of their abundance. This definition creates an understanding of tithing that moves us from letter of the law to the spirit of the law of give to your true capacity. So I was very encouraged. And, and then to conclude with the statement, all disciples are called to live as faithful stewards who tithe, so faithful stewards 
who um, practice what they say they believe. So the definition itself, I, I think, went through important evolutions through the guidance of the Spirit yes. and the people participated in that. And, and you can't ask no. for anything more than that. Yeah, and, and at first the statement it was really highlighted priesthood. Mm -hmm. and, and I liked it, as you said, as the Spirit moved in our midst that we realized it was all disciples. This is a deepening yes. for all disciples. Another change that I really think was Spirit-led was we often talk about generosity of time, talent, and treasure, but this added testimony. Yes. You want to comment on that addition, that one, what that one word might mean yeah. in the life of the church? I think that's continuing with the understanding that stewardship involves our whole life. Our testimony includes our spoken word, of witness or affirmation of the meaning of the gospel. But I think we need to understand it in a much broader way. My testimony is my life yeah. and how I'm living the gospel. I speak about it sometimes, but my testimony is how I have enfleshed the gospel in my whole life. So we begin with the concept of whole life stewardship. And even when we specifically list uh, time, talents, treasure, and testimony, we actually end with the concept whole life response is yes. the call. Yes, I, I really was appreciative, not only of the process, but what we ended up with and how it will guide the church. Mm -hmm. It was it was a good moment. Another step forward. It was a good step forward. Delegates came from all over the world, from Korea, Russia, Zambia, India, Honduras, to name just a few of the 60 nations where the church is established and has a presence. And the week before World Conference, about 200 international leaders gathered to talk about the resolutions, to talk about the definition of tithing, uh, to review and go further into the church's identity and what that means in those nations. In past world conferences, I've noted that oftentimes it's difficult for people who live in other countries and speak different languages than English to stand up at a business session and ask a question or share a perspective. But I was impressed at this World Conference because there were many delegates and leaders from places uh, all around the world who shared their perspectives, who offered uh, good words of counsel to the, to the conference. So how do you think that this international voice helped shape the World Conference? Well, we've called it World Conference for a number of years. And I think that was our aspiration, our vision for the future. Each conference, I think we're becoming more and more of a world conference. We, we still have a ways to go. Um, but this conference, uh, I keep saying it, uh, was another step forward. And it was in this instance also. I was reading an article uh, recently about some research that's been done on cultures. And one of the conclusions uh, was that we Americans need to recognize that most of the rest of the world uh, do, does not think like we do. And the rest of the world doesn't see reality as we think we see it. And we can become very blinded to truth when we think that our way of understanding life, the gospel, God, is the best way or the primary way or the only way. So when we're able to benefit from the 
perspectives, experiences, stories, and questions of people from other cultures, we are being blessed with insights into the nature of God and the will of God that we simply wouldn't receive uh, otherwise. And so it's a gift that Community of Christ has that we're not just nationally um, contained in terms of our church experience, but that we have this broad uh, international community and that we have in our finding ways to encourage others to share from their own perspective and culture, which is a real act of uh, <laughs> bravery for some of them uh, because they're not used to doing that. Uh, in other experiences in life, they're certainly not encouraged to do it. And for them to find their voice in an international assembly of over 2,000 delegates um, it's not only a blessing for us, but they are actually emerging as the person that they're created to be. And especially from some parts of the world to hear women and younger people get up and speak their mind and share their perspective is a uh, evidence that there is significant personal and leadership development that's, that's going on. As I was thinking about this question, I was reminded of the, of the passage in, in 160, section 162, paragraph 4. And I think this expresses it so well. It says, Listen carefully to the many testimonies of those around the world who have been led into the fellowship of the community of Christ. So this is God's initiative to bring this cultural diversity to us. The richness of cultures, the poetry of language, and the breadth of human experience permit the gospel to be seen with new eyes and grasped with freshness of spirit. This, that gift has been given to you. Do not fail to understand its power. It is for divine purposes that you have been given the struggles as well as the joys of diversity. So must it always be in the peaceable kingdom. Oh. And I think that captures it as, as well as any of what I've said yes. <laughs> might explain it. We were blessed by it. We still have some growth that needs to occur in our own capacity to have conversation cross-culturally. But now part of that is dependent on um, strengthening the number of translators who understand the languages and the cultures and also the church language and culture so that they can help us uh, communicate more effectively with each other and then we'll be even more blessed. Yes, absolutely. In your closing sermon, you challenged Community of Christ to see God's vision for us. And then you went further to say, that once we begin to see God's vision together, then we can start living it together. And once we start living it together, a new future is born. So what did you mean by those words? Well, in some ways it's a, it's a theological statement um, on the nature of God from my own perspective. And that is that God is always trying to relate to us in ways that will persuade us to turn our lives toward the future 
that is the expression of God's will and purposes. But human choice and human freedom is real. So sometimes God waits with eternal patience for us to make the choices that will align our lives with what God is wanting for us. The first step is to recognize the difference between the reality of the world as it is and the vision of how God would have it be if we embrace that vision. So, initially it is a seeing and envisioning, even if you don't see all of it. And that's the story of Scripture. Yeah. Abraham felt called to go to somewhere, a distant place. He didn't understand it fully, but he had enough of a vision of it that he was willing to move into that future, so he picked up his camp and he traveled and he pitched his tent in a new place. And I'm speaking both in terms of the Scripture story but also metaphorically. The power of vision is it gets us to break our camp, to move into the future. And somebody has to go first. And that's what it means to be a prophetic people. So the church is called to be that pioneering prophetic people that goes and sets up camp in the future that God desires us to have, which is the peaceable reign of God. And by doing that, we actually begin to uh, fulfill, uh, to realize that future. We are participating in future making by doing that. That's an act of vision. It's an act of hope. It's an act of faith. It's an act of not surrendering to current reality, but willing to go and live as if everything that God has promised already is, and that's how we're going to live in the world. Uh, and that's the call to the church. Yes, that's the call. And we caught a glimpse of that vision at World Conference. Yes. Thank you, Steve, for your prophetic visionary leadership. And thank you for listening in on our conversation. If you'd like to experience the 2016 World Conference, then read the July-August Herald, which is filled with images, stories, and sermons from conference. Also check out the Community of Christ website that has section 165 of the Doctrine and Covenants, an extensive photo album, daily bulletins, documents, and so much more, as well as Community of Christ YouTube channel that features 48 videos of worship moments and sermons, plus 36 in Spanish and 37 in French. It was a spirit-filled world conference. As President Vesey said in his closing World Conference sermon, this is a remarkably resilient church with a bright future if we allow God's vision for us to define our direction and priorities. God's vision, direction, and priorities are revealed in section 165, paragraphs 1a through 3. Community of Christ, a divine vision is set before you lovingly invite others to experience the good news of new life in community with Christ. Undertake compassionate and just actions to abolish poverty and end needless suffering. Pursue peace on and for the earth. Let nothing separate you from this mission. It reveals divine intent for personal, societal, and environmental salvation a fullness of gospel witness for creation's restoration. It is Community of Christ Leaders' Prayer that Section 165 and the experience of the 2016 World Conference 
will continue to form the church into the true and living expression of Jesus Christ. May both inspire you to make Christ's mission and God's vision real in the world to which you are sent. Thank you.